Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Thunder Bay Community Church for another week of our online worship. Uh, we're starting to get the hang of this. You know, this is our third week here. So I hope that uh, you're still having a little bit of patience with us as we kind of get into the swing of things. Today is uh, an exciting day. We are starting a sermon series on the book of Jeremiah. More about that later in our service. But I just want to start us off with a call to worship from Psalm 95. So if you have your Bibles, open it up to Psalm 95 and follow along with me. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the, are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the, the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care. So with that in mind, let us sing our first song, a hymn of the church, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, and let's give all the praise and glory to our Lord.
Glad that you've chosen to join us once again this week. And this week is a little bit of a special week because we are going to kick off a sermon series that will bring us right into the first week of September. We are going to be spending the next seven weeks looking at the prophet Jeremiah. Now, a lot of people kind of know Jeremiah for Jeremiah 29 and 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope for a future. And while that's all good, I want us to kind of dive into Jeremiah to see what God is going to reveal to us through his word. This week, we are starting with Jeremiah chapter 1, the call of Jeremiah, where God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet. So I'm going to be reading from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, from the New International Version. And I invite you to pull out your Bibles, whether it's on your phone or if you've got a physical one like me, and follow along. Jeremiah 1.1. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, son, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Hello kids! Today we're going to be playing a game and this game is specifically a guessing game. I've brought four objects with me today and I will show them to you and I want you to guess what their purpose is or what they're used for. So I'm actually going to start with something really easy, hopefully, for you to guess. So this is my first object. Now, you could think that maybe this is a fancy hat, this eardrop, just like this. Or maybe it's a parachute for a toy. But really, this object is to help us Stay safe during COVID-19. So this is actually a face mask. Ta-da! Wow. And hopefully you got that one right because you have masks at home just like this. My next object might be a little harder. So I'll show it to you. If you guess that this is a remote, you are correct, but it's a very, very specific remote. This remote belongs to something in my house, and you might not have one because it's just so special. And this remote specifically, it has a button to turn the lights on in my bedroom, and buttons to turn the fan on on the ceiling. So this remote only works and comes with that specific fan, and it has a very specific purpose. The next object I have is rather long. And this is my third object. Does anyone know what this possibly could be used for? Some of it might look a little familiar, but this end part is the part that's a little different than most times you see it. This, although it could be a fancy scarf, is not 
and it's actually designed for a very specific purpose, and that purpose is to charge my watch. It works with my watch, but it's possible that you and your watch, it does not charge. And it's possible it does not charge other watches that aren't watches that even charge. Maybe they have batteries. But this specific cord is to charge my specific watch, and it has a very particular purpose. This is my last item. See, looks maybe familiar to some things you have in your house, but does anyone know what this specific thing is? This specific thing is a 2018 Escape Owner's Manual. Wow, ah, ooh, very particular. So this book helps me when I'm in my car and something might not be sounding right or maybe I don't know how to use something. This book helps me to know exactly how to fix it, how to use it, all of the stuff. Very particular to my car. So your car might have one and there might be different versions of this book for different years, but this book has a very specific purpose and the purpose of this book is to help me with my exact car. So all of these items have been created with a very specific purpose. You might find different variations to these items, or you might have something that doesn't even need the item, but these have a very specific purpose. And just like these items have a purpose, scripture says that God has created us, he loves us, and we also have a very specific purpose. Purpose, which is what we're talking about today. Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Which sounds really fancy. That's probably a title you've never received before prophet to the nations. But this just means that we are to share with the world who God is and the love that He has with everyone that we meet.
Because we are starting this sermon series on Jeremiah that will take us through the rest of the summer, I think it is important for me to set the scene a little bit so that we can understand where Jeremiah operated from. Jeremiah was a prophet, meaning that he spoke on behalf of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Jeremiah was from a town called Anathoth, which was just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. And without going into too many details, at this point of history, the nation that began as Israel had been, uh, they had some conflict and it, it actually split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So uh, Jeremiah was from Judah and, and that's where he began his time as a prophet. His time as a prophet encompassed two prominent kings of Judah, King Josiah and King Jehoiakim. In this area of the world, there were three political uh, superpowers. You had Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. And, you know, they kind of took their turns being in power, and we kind of see that through the biblical narrative. And they were pretty good at keeping each other in check. But at this point in history, Babylon had grown unusually strong, and they were a threat not only to Egypt and Assyria, but also to smaller nations like Israel and uh, Judah. And that's going to be important for us a few sermons down the road. For a while up until this point of time, the people of Judah and of Israel were straying further and further from God, from his teachings, and from the covenant they had made with him. King Josiah wanted to kind of uh, implement some religious reform, uh, but his successor, King Jehoiakim, had other aims. And amid all of this backdrop, this is where we find ourselves starting out in uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. We know from other accounts in the Bible, such as 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, that King Josiah began to seek the God of his father David. When he became the king, he began dismantling the altars of Baal. He instructed the high priest to take some tax money and began renovating and restoring the temple. And during this renovation, the high priest discovered, or I should say rediscovered, the book of the law, the Torah. Now, that was what we know as the Hebrew Bible. It's found in our Bible. We know it as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And these texts contain the law that was given by Yahweh to Moses. This one anecdote of how the book of the law had to be rediscovered just goes to show how far away Israel had strayed from God and his way. The law was buried and hidden away for many, many years, only to be found again when the temple was going through renovations. It goes without saying that Israel was not following the commandments of God if they had no knowledge of the law. So how did the people of Jeremiah's world act? If we look at it from a religious perspective, the people had devoted themselves to Baal. Baal was an idol god of the Canaanites, and we might be familiar with the prophet Elijah's encounters with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. And this, the fact that Baal had such a following in Israel goes directly against Yahweh's commandment to uh, Israel that they should have no other gods before him. From a political perspective, the kings of Israel and Judah had their own agenda. When the king was installed by Yahweh in 1 Samuel, he was meant to be the political and religious leader of Israel. However, by Jeremiah's time, the kings had their own ambitions of power, prosperity, wealth, the covenant was forgotten, the law was abandoned. From an economic and social perspective, people were greedy. Society's most vulnerable, and in this case that would be the widows, the orphans, uh, the ill, they were not being protected and were in most cases being taken advantage of. The wealth of the nation was being hoarded by the rich 
and the poor, which comprised the majority of the nation, was helpless. This was not the type of society that Yahweh had imagined and decreed into existence. What a sorry state the nation of Israel was in. But with all of that said, it isn't hard to picture our own world fitting in with this image. From a religious perspective, fewer and fewer people identify with religion at all. According to Statistics Canada, of the close to 33 million residents of Canada in 2011, close to 8 million did not declare a religion. And of the 22 million people that declared themselves as being Christians, only 5 million said that they went to a religious service on a regular basis. And these were numbers from 10 years ago, and it's hard to imagine that they haven't decreased since then. From a political perspective, it is not a very savvy move for politicians to be open with their faith. It is almost seen as a negative, as a strike against them if they are religious. And from an economic and social perspective, the wealth inequality of our world is probably much larger than it was in Jeremiah's time. You know, we think of these billionaires such as uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson. They have a combined weight or a wealth of $370 billion. They're launching themselves into space instead of distributing their wealth in a way that benefits the poorest and the most vulnerable of the societies of the world. Our world doesn't know who God is. Collectively, as a whole, we have no knowledge of him. Some people outright reject him, and we certainly aren't living according to his way. Maybe we are the sorry ones after all. But I think there is still hope for us yet. And it begins with listening to this encounter that Jeremiah has with God. While his world didn't know who God was, God specifically set Jeremiah apart for his work and purposes. God tells Jeremiah in verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. And here's the way that I want us to think about this small portion of scripture this morning. Before I formed you in the womb, I chose you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. Here we read that God had chosen Jeremiah for his work. God, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, saw the man that Jeremiah would become even before he was conceived. God put his mark on his life to be set apart. But what does it mean to be set apart? Another word that we could use that means the same thing is consecrated. And this word consecrated is used throughout the Bible, and I'm about to give you some examples. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and consecrated it, making it holy, because on it God rested from the work that he had done in creation. Exodus 19, 10, and 11. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day, because on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Joshua 3, 5. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So after hearing these three references in Scripture, I'll, I'm going to give you my definition of what it means to be consecrated. To be consecrated means to become holy, ready to stand in God's presence, and ready to do His work. The message paraphrase puts it this way, God speaking to Jeremiah, Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. God had plans for Jeremiah, 
on the backdrop of his world turning their back on God and living according to their own plans, God chooses Jeremiah to lean into God and to live according to God's plans. That is grace. And amid all the evil that was going on, God was still at work, calling people to live for him and to be holy, to be set apart or different or separate from the others in the world so that they could accomplish the work that the Lord had set out to be done. A biblical scholar named Catherine Skiffendecker says this, Jeremiah's life was about something bigger than himself, something bigger than his own desires. It was about God's work, and God claimed him before he was even born. And in a similar way, God continues to call men and women to step into something bigger than themselves and to be set apart for his purposes. You and I are being drawn in by God to stand as his holy people, to be ready to stand in his presence and to accomplish God's work. Like Jeremiah, God is offering this sacred relationship to each of us. And before you respond to that calling, I want you to consider Jeremiah's response. He says back to God in verse 6, Alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. And it isn't really his age that Jeremiah is disputing here, but his ability. He feels like he is inadequately equipped to do the work that God has set out for him. He's worried that he will falter and let God down. Juliana Claussen says this about Jeremiah's response. With this hesitation, it is clear that as elsewhere in the biblical narrative, God uses ordinary, fallible human beings to serve as his witnesses. In response to Jeremiah, God gives this promise in verse 8. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and I will deliver you. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. You know, Jeremiah is probably correct. If Jeremiah went and tried to fulfill God's work in his own strength alone, he would fail. I know he would. But God assures him that not only will he be there with Jeremiah, but that God will put his own words in his mouth to speak. What an assurance that is today. This task that God is calling us into, should we accept it, means that not only do we become his holy people, ready to stand in his presence and ready to do his work, but it comes with the assurance that God will be right by our side and that he will give us the words to say to bring about his own desires. In the message paraphrase, God says, I will be right there looking after you. And what exactly is the work that God is preparing us for? We're going to talk more about this uh, in more detail next week. But God gives us a little bit of a glimpse in verse 10. I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. You see, just like in Jeremiah's time, God has had enough of our rebellions. God is instituting a new era. And there are things about this current era that we have built that need to be torn down. Things such as wealth inequality, poverty, hunger, all other sorts of injustice. They have no place in this era that God is raising. They need to be destroyed. Catherine Skiffendecker says this, Living during a time of political and religious upheaval, Jeremiah is called to speak an uncomfortable word. A dangerous word, a word that will call people into account. God is setting us apart to be that voice, and we are called to speak out against injustice that we see every day. 
but there is also hope. We are being called to build and to plant as well. We want to cultivate a society where every voice is heard in one accord, where we respect the inherent rights of each person, where there is no hunger or thirst, where there is no excessive wealth, where there is no excessive poverty. And my, my list could go on and on. This is the kingdom of God, and God will use us to help build it. It is part of our mandate of being God's holy people, ready to stand in his presence and ready to do his work. Are you ready to accept God's calling today? He wants us to be set apart for his purposes according to his will. He has plans for us that are much bigger than any plans that we can have. As we set aside some time to reflect on what God is doing in our lives, I want to urge you to ask yourself this question. How will I be God's representative this week? In what way will I be set apart for God's purposes? There's not just one answer to this, but let me give you a few examples. Perhaps you will speak God's truth into a situation. Perhaps you will look into ways you can reach out and help our nation's most vulnerable people in God's name. Perhaps you will look into scripture and further see the plan that God has set you on. Whatever you do this week, whatever you answer to this question of how you will be God's representative, I encourage you to consecrate yourselves Seek the Lord, be prepared to be his holy people, to stand in his presence, and to do his work.
Will you pray with me this morning? God, our Heavenly Father, you alone are holy. You alone are righteous. You alone have the infinite knowledge and wisdom that it takes to govern our universe. And Lord, right now, as we respond to this call that you have given us, Lord, help us to be holy in our lives to the best of the abilities that you have given us. Help us to lean into you. Help us to rely on your strength. Help us to search you, God, and have you search us as we prepare to be your holy people. So Lord, I pray that as we prepare for this mission that you have tasked us with, that we would be humble, that we would continue to rely on you, to continue to rely on your word, and to continue to rely on your Holy Spirit, Lord. In times of trouble when we don't know what to say, give us the words in our mouth and be there beside us as we carry out your work, Lord. So Lord, we just dedicate this time to you. Consecrate us, Lord. Fit us for your purposes, Lord. Fit us for your glory. And we pray this in your infinitely matchless name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week for our virtual service. It has been great learning more about how God has set us apart for his purposes. We hope that you choose to worship with us again next week. Bye!